Vsauce, Kevin here. When Sammy the Bull Gravano ratted on the Mafia, he wasn't just saving his own skin, he was engaging in a high-stakes game theory exercise. Because we all know that snitches get stitches. Snitching is such a severe social transgression that Judas Iscariot has been paying for snitching on Jesus to the Romans for nearly 2,000 years. And the 30 pieces of silver Judas received for his betrayal is still the benchmark for an informant's dishonorable compensation. Even little kids have a sense that snitching is disgraceful conduct. They ostracize the kids who tattle or squeal. In southern Italy, the code of conduct known as Omerta governed the Mafia's refusal to cooperate with authorities against others within the organization. It was a blood oath, and a pentito, someone who broke Omerta, was a rat. You take that oath, you never betray, you never talk, you never say anything, no matter who violates you. So are Julian Assange and Edward Snowden heroic whistleblowers who risked everything to lay bare the truth? Or are they just weasels, stool pigeons, or traitors? It depends who you ask. But I think that what seems like an issue of virtue and self-interest is a lot more complex. It's a mix of human behavior and game theory, a combination of morals and math. Now we actually play the game is so perverse that we make it nearly impossible to actually get to the truth. What's a stool pigeon? An antiquated method for catching pigeons was to tie one pigeon to a stool. As it flapped its wings, hopelessly trying to escape, that attracted other pigeons to its location where they could be captured easily. So calling a pigeon a rat with wings works on a couple different levels. The most pure example of snitching and its consequences is exposed in The Prisoner's Dilemma. You probably already know how it works, so I'll keep it brief. Two men are arrested and they're separated. If neither snitches on the other one, police can still convict each of them on a lesser charge with a two-year sentence. If one turns on the other, that testimony will allow a conviction on a greater charge with a 10-year sentence, and the snitch will go free. If both betray each other, it's five years each. The payoff matrix shows all the possible outcomes of both A and B snitching or not snitching, and it immediately raises questions about the best strategy. If you're A, should you stay silent and hope B stays silent too? Two years. Does it make more sense to betray your friend and hope you go free if he maintains silence? Even if it means risking five years if the other guy talks too. If you snitch, your possible outcomes are five years or zero. Betrayal means you will avoid a 10-year sentence no matter what. Remaining loyal and not talking gives you possible outcomes of 10 years and two years. So what's loyalty worth to you? It's irrational to put stock in loyalty and the dominant strategy for both players is to betray one another. That's the big game theory takeaway from The Prisoner's Dilemma. It's such a seminal concept that its offshoots and implications on decision theory are referenced over 62,000 times on Google Scholar. And the most comprehensive analysis of all things Prisoner's Dilemma, Stanford's Encyclopedia of Philosophy, is over 30,000 words. In spite of nearly 75 years of scholarship, we've obfuscated and flat out ignored the aspect that dictates how this game affects real lives in real life. The house always wins. In The Prisoner's Dilemma, players are incentivized to betray. The worst case scenario for a player is he honors the code and his friend betrays him. The best case is he betrays his friend stays loyal and he avoids prison time. But even in that freedom scenario, he's branded a snitch for life. He'll face consequences in the community for ratting out the other guy. Even winning is losing. But there is no outcome where the police lose. They can only win. It's just a question of how much. 
The FBI itself says that informants have played major roles in the investigation and prosecution of a wide variety of federal crimes since the inception of the Bureau in 1908. And even with clear published guidelines about how informant programs work, the whole thing is a murky soup of threats and payoffs. And whether it's the FBI or NYPD or Soviet KGB system of Sakritni Sotrudnik, it's always worked pretty much the same way. The cops need information to prosecute criminals. If they don't get it through investigation, they need to get it through testimony. Sometimes witnesses are totally comfortable telling what they know, but most of the time they're not because of the snitches get stitches repercussion. And that's when the game theory changes. In 2021, researchers discovered 19 bone fish hooks and six grooved stones on the Jordan River in Israel. They turned out to be up to 15,000 year old fishing tackle. Hooks and sinkers haven't changed that much since ancient times, but how we fish has. Fishing Clash lets anyone with a smartphone or tablet travel the world to engage in one of humanity's oldest sport and survival activities. You can compete against other anglers, upgrade your rods and tackle, increase skills and level up, and all the while experiencing real, legendary fishing locations like the Lost World. It's a fishing simulator, an outdoor fishing app, and a PvP game. Click the link in the description or use the QR code to download the game and use my gift code Vsauce2 to get an awesome $20 value reward for free. You'll get a unique avatar, a mythical lure card, 50 luck power-ups, and 30 weight power-ups to help you catch the largest fish. Thanks to Fishing Clash for supporting Vsauce2 and for helping me make the videos I want to make. And good luck to you on the water. The one running the game has two options, threats and incentives, or both. In The Prisoner's Dilemma, both players are offered potential but not guaranteed immunity if they give up the other guy. Co-defendants and people arrested for other stuff are offered everything from lighter charges and sentences to full amnesty, while incarcerated informants can get simple prison perks or full release. Paid informants basically have a job and a paycheck. Informants have to decide how they want to play to avoid punishment or balance their payoffs with the potential consequences of those payoffs, while the game masters just sit around and wait to see how much they've won. Not a bad deal. Maybe that's fair. In The Prisoner's Dilemma, we know that both players are criminals. That's why the cops are 100% confident they can convict them on that lesser two-year charge. There's no wrongfully charged man in the dilemma, and there's no guy trying to improve his already grim circumstances or looking for a handful of cash. But rewarding snitches is such a twisted game to play, it almost got innocent people executed for killing a man who wasn't even dead. In 1819, Jesse and Stephen Bourne were convicted and sentenced to death in Vermont for killing their brother-in-law, Russell Colvin. There wasn't a ton of evidence, but Jesse Bourne's cellmate, Silas Merrill, said that Jesse confessed to him in detail. Merrill testified against the brothers and was rewarded with his own freedom from a forgery conviction. But just before Jesse and Stephen were to be hanged, Colvin was found alive in New Jersey. He wasn't even dead, let alone murdered by the Bourne brothers. It was a rare win for justice, and the cops who always benefit even they kind of won since they were spared from the wrong of putting innocent men to death. Yes, a forger went free. <clears throat> Merrill's dishonesty reveals one of the obvious problems with informant culture, an incentive to lie. You already have an inherent sense of the problems with snitching, but let's codify it. When it comes to criminal justice, three things matter. What's known, when it's known, and who knows it. Truth is not necessarily part of that equation. To start, informants are suspect because they're usually implicated in antisocial behavior already, so they're kinda difficult to trust. Why wouldn't they just make things up to hurt the people they hate and protect their own? And don't all the benefits feel a little like a reward for criminals? But the problems with the snitching game are only the beginning. Sometimes informants are forced to play a game within that game. 
Witness intimidation happens when criminals use their own system of threats and payoffs to influence witness testimony. If a witness is forced to play a game where the house always wins and you'll face consequences for their testimony, then you can't win either. So your only option is to wreck the whole game by silencing them. If you've ever watched any mob movie, you've seen how the Mafia's Omerta Code is enforced. But what makes for great entertainment has ruined real lives like Anthony Brown's. Nearly half, half of death row wrongful convictions have been tied to unreliable informants. Anthony Brown was sentenced to death in Florida in 1983 for murder, but the actual killer testified against him in exchange for his own lenience. And it was the same for Randall Adams. He was convicted of killing a police officer in 1977, while the informant, who was the real killer, received immunity from the prosecution in exchange for his testimony. Neat trick. Want to go down a rat rabbit hole? Google Randy Steidel. In Randy's case, a cop sacrificed his own job to expose the truth about the snitch system that wrongfully convicted him of murder. Randy spent 17 years in prison for murders he didn't commit. And although he won a multi-million dollar settlement from his town and the state of Illinois, he wasn't pardoned. So as a society, what can we do to combat the perverse incentives of snitching? We at least need to understand how information games are played in real life. History has morphed the Roman goddess Justitia into the modern image of Lady Justice. She's usually depicted as holding a scale that balances the act with its consequences. She's blindfolded, which is meant to symbolize impartiality. But nearly 500 years ago, Flemish painter Peter Brugel portrayed a static, unmoving Lady Justice wearing a blindfold to suggest that she was failing to see injustice. So which is it? Is she impartial or just ignorant? I don't know. But I do know that as long as her lips are free to play the oldest game in crime and punishment, snitching and stitching, it might not even matter. And as always, thanks for watching. Thanks again to Fishing Clash for sponsoring Vsauce 2. Download now.